Thank you. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments today, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2, that is SP Bill 19A, the marshalled list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division this afternoon and the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on the group of amendments should press their request to seat button as soon as possible after I call the group. I hope that's all clear. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 2 and 4. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I have said throughout the passage of this bill that there would be a gap in legislation if the Section 6 offence is repealed. This is a simple statement of fact, despite assertions to the contrary. Repealing the Section 6 offence puts Scotland behind the rest of the UK in terms of protection against incitement to religious hatred. And therefore, we do need to take steps to seek to ensure continuity of protection. Section 6 contains extraterritorial powers, ensuring that freedom of movement does not, does not mean escaping the law. This power will be lost if the Act is repealed. Also at stage 2, I highlighted the oral evidence from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, referencing a case in which an accused person posted comments that were supportive of a prescribed terrorist organisation, ISIS. The sentencer's view was that the severity of those actions should be reflected in a starting point of 24 months imprisonment. That starting point would not have been available in the alternative charge under the 2003 Communications Act. The actual... <laughs> Certainly. James Kelly. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. I wonder if she's had an opportunity to reflect on the submission, uh, the oral submission myself and Liam MacArthur made to the Justice Committee pointing out that in the case that she quotes section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act allows uh, a, a charge in relation to threatening online behaviour and also sentences of up to five years. So there's no gap in the law. Well, I, yes, I, I would beg to differ and I'm just actually getting on to, to section 38 because the actual legal position presiding officer is such that the need, there's a need to satisfy uh, as far as breach of the peace, uh, the offensive breach of the peace is concerned, a two-part test. So that is conduct causing fear and alarm uh, and which threatens serious disturbance to the community. And, of course, the higher threshold for a conviction uh, for an offence under Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. That is that the fear and alarm test must be met, whereas no similar hurdle uh, persists with, pertains with respect to section six. That means, right. presiding officer, that those offences cannot be relied upon to deal with section six offences. And it will mean that some section six offences will go unpunished. In that respect, repeal of section six will indeed result in a gap in the law. Presiding officer, section six provides a specific offence of making threatening communications with intent to stir up religious hatred. It makes clear what type of communications constitutes an offence, of making threatening communications and also makes clear what type of communications will not lead to criminal proceedings and it pro provides protection for freedom of speech. Breach of the peace in section 38, as I said, do not provide the same level of certainty and do not send uh, a strong enough message that we intend to deal robustly with crimes of religious hatred. At the moment, we have a specific offence of making communications intended to stir up racial hatred under part three of the Public Order Act 1986. If Section 6 of the 2012 Act is repealed, we will have no similar offence of sending communications intended to stir up religious hatred. Is that really the message that we want to send, that we do not take religious hatred as seriously as racial hatred? Equality groups have been very clear that they place great importance on the protection that the Act offers them, particularly Section 6. Uh, and it is absolutely right that we look at constructive ways to ensure that support for repeal does not leave them feeling exposed and unprotected. As a responsible government, we have a duty to make every effort to minimise the negative impact that would be caused by repeal. I'm afraid I need to make progress, I've already taken one, but we need time to do this by preparing a new bill to reinstate the Section 6 offence going forward. Hence, we seek continuity of protection in the interim. 
That is why I have brought forward, again at stage three, amendments one, two and four to adjust sections five and six, which deal with the date of commencement for the bill. The effect of amendments one, two and four is to delay the commencement of the repeal of the section six offence by 12 months from royal assent. When combined with amendment three in grouping two, which we will come to shortly, the amendments also delay the commencement of the repeal of the section one offence by two months. Amendment one amends the definition of the relevant date in section five of the bill so that it takes account of the different commencement dates for the section one and the section six offences that would result from these amendments. Amendment two amends section six of the bill to confine the existing default commencement provision so that it applies only to the repeal of the section one offence. Currently, the bill provides that the default commencement provision for the bill is for it to come into force on the day after royal assent. But our amendment three, which we will come to in the next group, would, if agreed, change that so that the default commencement is two months after royal assent. And that is to say the normal position with regard to legislation dealing with Scots criminal law. Amendment four provides that the bill, so far as repealing the rest of the 2012 Act, that is the section six offence of sending threatening communications, comes into force at the end of the period of 12 months, beginning with the day of royal assent. Presiding officer, as I have consistently explained throughout the passage of this bill, repealing section six creates a gap in the legislation that does need to be addressed. And those claiming that there would be no gap if the act were repealed are simply wrong. I move amendment one. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against Amendment 1 and the other amendments in Group 1. These amendments seek to delay the Section 6 offence coming in from 12 months from Royal Assent. This precise issue was considered at Stage 2, and the effect of this, whether or not Amendment 3 is passed today, would be to implement a staggered repeal. That is to say, the Section 6 offences, notwithstanding the lack of them due to the threshold of prosecution having been set too high, could continue, in theory, to be prosecuted for some considerable time after repeal of the rest of the Act. Now, I recall at stage two, the thinking behind this was to come up with an alternative legislative provision to deal with the circumstances covered by Section 6 of the 2012 Act. Notwithstanding that I am not persuaded that there is a requirement to do so, as we will hear later, I do not concede that there would be a gap in the law. I cannot help but feel that this will add complexity to what would otherwise be a straightforward appeal. I suspect later we will debate at length the message that will be sent out if the 2012 Act is repealed. I intend to answer that point in my submission later, but here I use the argument to my own advantage. If we assume that stage three today concludes with the repeal bill being passed, it will be all over the press, sending a very clear message that the 2012 Act has been repealed. What confusion, what complexity what inconsistency will be sown if a little used, little understood single section of this act has been retained and prosecutions could be and are continued for the following 12 months? Yes, I will. Minister. To the member for taking intervention. Clearly, it is, uh, as I have explained, there will be a gap for the reasons I have just stated once again for the record. Uh, and what, what is the member saying then to all the equality groups uh, who, and faith groups who raise the concern that repealing section six without any viable alternative being put in its place sends the wrong signal, takes away protection that they rely upon. What is the problem with retaining section six for a further period of 12 months? Why is the member determined to take that protection away from these vulnerable communities? Liam Kerr. I thank the minister for the intervention. There is no gap. Professor Leverick was clear in the committee there will be no gap. It will be prosecuted under the other legislation. The groups are not having protection detracted from them. They can be reassured by the message. All that you are seeking to do, Minister, is introduce complexity, confusion and inconsistency over the next 12 months. That would not be welcome. And given that transitional arrangements will take care of the existing matters, this amendment is neither required it is not productive and it is not helpful. The Scottish Conservatives shall vote against Amendment 1 and all those in the group. Thank you. I call on Ben McPherson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. I rise to speak in favour of the amendment and all the other amendments in the group because these amendments are about being responsible. And I refer members to the 
stage one report from the Justice Committee, which refers to some of the very powerful evidence we heard around Section 6, and a particularly quote from the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, who said that Section 6 is an important transnational power that catches conduct that would not otherwise be caught by Scots law. Given the runaway growth of social media, this matter probably needs more careful and extended consideration of the kind that Lord Brackendale is giving it, instead of simply knee-jerk repeal. Now, it's clear that the 2012 Act, there is a distinction between the different offences in sections 1 to 5 and sections 1 to 6, and that distinction was made in the evidence that we took. I think the Minister is absolutely right to have brought these amendments on the basis of responsibility and on the basis of making sure that our legal system serves the needs of those who require it. And by simply asking for an extension in, in, before repeal of Section 6 in order to make sure that there isn't a gap in the law, and actually the point about the extraterritorial provision of Section 6 has not been questioned in any of the evidence that I've heard or seen around this matter. So to give the government and others adequate time to make sure that there isn't a gap in the law, particularly around the transnational element, is the responsible and right thing to do. And responsible MSPs will vote in favour of these amendments. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against the, the government amendments and against the extension of Section 6. It beca has become very clear through Stage 1 and 2 of the passage of this bill that there's no legal need for the Section 1 offences uh, under the Offensive Behaviour Act because as the Law Society and other uh, uh, people giving evidence such as Professor Leverick have made very clear, Section 38 of the Criminal Justice Act and common law breach of the peace will allow disruptive behaviour to be prosecuted. Now, I hear the concern about Section 6, and I, I understand that, but the reality is there's only been one conviction under this section of the Act in the last year. Furthermore, it's been very clear from the evidence that this is an Act which is too narrowly drafted to be used, as ACC Higgins uh, gave evidence that it's rarely used and the police prefer to bring forward charges under Section 127 of the Communications Act 2003. Furthermore, the Law Society um, has made clear that common law can be used, citing the case of HM Advocate versus McGinley in 2012. And indeed, even the Scottish Government's commissioned uh, an independent review on hate crime legislation noted that Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act and uh, Section 127 of the Communications Act would, and I quote, remain relevant in the vast majority of cases. So I think it is very clear that repealing Section 1 and Section 6 will leave no gap in the law. Thank you. Um, I call Lee MacArthur to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I uh, rise to speak against uh, these amendments. This debate seems to uh, hang on the issue of whether or not uh, there is a gap. Let me quote from the Law Society's briefing. The bill, if passed, will not leave any gap in the criminal law as existing measures, both statutory and at common law, will allow for the prosecution of any relevant offending behaviour, provided that sufficient admiss admissible evidence uh, exists. It could not, I think, be clear. And in relation to um, the message that this sends out, and I think Ben McPherson quite rightly draws attention to the, the evidence the committee uh, received uh, at stage one uh, from a number of, of representatives of uh, those of protected uh, characteristics. But I fail to see how keeping in place an act that is not providing the protections that its supporters maintain is sending out the wrong message or even acting in the interests of those it professes uh, to protect. In terms of the amendments themselves, uh, they suggest a delay of 12 months, but as the Minister herself conceded uh, during uh, cross-examination at stage two, uh, the, the, the point by which uh, the government would be uh, able to bring forward uh, any um, uh, replacement legislation would extend beyond 12 months, and therefore were there to be a gap, that gap uh, would still uh, exist. I'll take, an I'll take an intervention. Minister. The intervention. Um, but would the member not agree that surely in the interest of, of ensuring con continuity protection, it would be better to uh, seek to do what we could to uh, ensure that protection continues for a further 12 months rather than taking away that protection from as early as mid-April? MacArthur. 
as I've already explained, it's not providing the protection you assert that it's uh, providing. And therefore, it seems to me um, ridiculous and, and somewhat irresponsible to allow the misconception to go unchallenged that the law is providing protection to Pluto. It's not, in fact, the case. At some stage, the Scottish Government is going to have to recognise that this bill, this illiberal, ineffective, misdirected bill is going to be repealed and continuing to promote this notion that there is going to be a gap or a dilution of protection is wholly irresponsible. Yeah. Fulton McGregor. Thanks for in support of the amendments. Today at general questions I raised the issue of van vandalism in my constituency in the context of sectarianism both at St Pat's Church and at the Cenotaph last year. And I also raised the issue, uh, just reported recently in news, of a local business owner who had been subjected to threatening communication online following Sunday's Old Firm game. Unfortunately, sectarianism is still a major problem in constituencies like mine, and I'm glad that Elaine Smith also touched on that in her question. Um, not just now. No. Yeah, OK. Go for it. Joanne Lamont. I wonder what message it gives to tackling sectarianism to cut the budget for anti-sectarianism projects from three... Maybe you agree with this. Let me finish the point. Cutting the budgets from three million pounds to half a million pounds. How does that send out a message about tackling sectarianism? Fulton McGregor. Well, jo Joanne Lamont knows fine well this government has invested heavily in tackling sectarianism, and she knows that. She knows that. But throughout, but go, 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 going back to my point, throughout taking evidence, it was clear there was a difference between section one and section six, and nobody from any party can deny that. Members across the board recognised it. The section, and we did all agree, I acknowledge that as well, that section one could be better reformed in issues such as the feeling that, that young men particularly would have been penalised. We could maybe address that better through the, uh, the diversion schemes. But the, whatever the merits of section one are, or the, or the repeal of section one, section six is totally different, and it's irresponsible and, and does indeed send out a wrong message to just repeal this today. And as no other member is asked to speak in this group, I'll call on James Kelly to wind up. Uh, no, the Minister will wind up. James Kelly first before the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to oppose all the amendments uh, in this group. I believe they are unnecessary. Uh, first of all, I think the thing to understand about Section 6 is it has hardly been used in the six years that the Act has been in place. There have only been 17 prosecutions, and as Daniel Johnson pointed out, only one conviction in the last year. And the reason for that, as the police told us at the Justice Committee, is that the way the legislation has been drafted is that the threshold, the threshold has been set too high, and yep. therefore uh, the route that police and prosecutors, uh, pr prosecutors are taking is to go down the route of the Communications Act and not use Section 6 in relation to threatening communications. Sure. I'm Minister. grateful to the member for taking the intervention. I, I, just on that point, because of course the member and maybe other members of the chamber will be aware or may be interested to be aware that actually there was a very recent conviction, successful conviction under Section 6 and the issue concerned uh, a 54-year-old man having been charged with making a death threat against Neil Lennon. That was a recent successful conviction under Section 6, the section that the member wishes to take away. James Kelly. And that, and that brings me on to my next point, is that uh, repealing Section 6 would not leave a gap in the law. The point, the, the point that came out at the Stage 1 debate was that the Communication Act only allowed sentences up to one year, whereas Section 6 allowed a sentence up to five years. But in looking at the issue in relation to the Section 38 offence, uh, an offence that the Minister relates to there. You can do a trial uh, on indictment and you, somebody can be sentenced for, for five years. And there is, there is case law that backs this up, HM Advocate versus McGinley, on a breach of the, the peace charge. In terms of uh, cover in relation to religious minorities, you, as Professor Leverick pointed out at committee, you can add a Section 74 religious aggravation, as happened in the Love versus PF uh, Stirling case. So there are, there, there's no gap in the law. There's legislation in place and there's also case law in place mm. that demonstrate that there's not a gap in the law. I also agree with Liam MacArthur's point that if 
this was in any way a serious position for the government. They would have been proposing at least an 18-month gap to bring forward legislation. A 12-month gap uh, is, a, is a minimal amount of time that wouldn't have allowed legislation to be brought forward. So this is simply a, a face-saving measure from the government. The other, I think, important point to recognise is the one made by the Law Society and the submission ahead of this debate in talking about matters in relation to repeal when they said there is always merit in clarity, simplicity and consistency of the law and this would be provided if the 2012 Act is repealed in its entirety at one time. What the Minister is seeking to do here is to have uh, different, uh, different timings in relation to repeal. The preferred route from the Minister's point of view is uh, a, a delay of 12 months for Section 6 and two months for Section 1 to 5. And that would be going against the wise counsel of the uh, Law Society. I think the, the point in relation to protection of minorities, you can't really offer proper protection if the law uh, has been unused, if we're only seeing one uh, conviction in the last year. So in summing up, presiding officer, this aspect of the law is little used. There's no gap. There's no point in leaving a, a, a law in place that hasn't been used properly and credibly. It's time to move quickly to repeal and to use the credible, robust, pre-existing legislation that's already in place. Absolutely. Thank you. Now that James Kelly, who's the member in charge, has been allowed to respond, I'll ask the minister to wind up. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, there is no question about the fact that there would be a gap in the legislation of Section 6 was repealed, a point indeed recognised by Daniel Johnson when he referred to the fact that only the majority of cases could fall within the provision, uh, within other provisions, not 100% of the cases. And indeed, uh, in response to Mr Kelly and, and Mr MacArthur, I would say once again what I said in the opening statement, uh, and of course they will be you know, very uh, expert now on, on these legal matters, uh, given their perusal. But what I would say again, uh, for the record, is that breach of the peace uh, involves uh, not only a fear and alarm test, but also uh, an element that concerns uh, a threatening of serious disturbance to the community. That is a problem with regard to some Section 6 issues. And also with regard to Section 38, there is a fear and alarm hurdle, which is not the case in Section 6. So I hope that once and for all, uh, as a, a lawyer myself, I can clarify uh, that hopefully for the members. Uh, in this instance, I would also say, presiding officer, I would also say, presiding officer, that I don't think, to be fair, the author of the, the Law Society paper that has been referred to, uh, the author of the paper that they produced, particularly for Stage 3, has got it uh, quite right, because, as I say, it is a simple matter of fact that the repeal of Section 6 will leave a gap in the law that the Scottish Government, acting responsibly and in the best interest of minority and vulnerable communities, needs to address. And my intention with this amendment is to seek the time to address this problem. A 12-month period, challenging indeed, but nonetheless realistic to introduce alternative uh, legislation on si uh, Section 6 issues. And the argument that because it may take a wee bit longer than that, we should just take away the protection potentially from mid-April, I find very uh, uh, confused indeed. We do not want Scotland to be behind the rest of the UK in terms of protection against incitement to religious hatred because, of course, by taking Section 6 away, there will be no specific offence of incitement to religious hatred in Scots law. I had, uh, as I say, given the example of ISIS in my opening statement, and I have in intervention to Mr Kelly, highlighted the recent successful conviction under Section 6 of a 50-year-old man charged with making death threats against Neil Lennon. Presiding officer, this gap in the law needs serious consideration by the Scottish Government so that we can work with partner organisations and those interested in ensuring that our minority communities have adequate recourse to law when they are attacked or harassed. And that requires a bit of extra time to put in place longer term protection against incitement to religious hatred in Scotland. This is not a complicated proposition, uh, as the Law Society appeared to suggest. It is quite the opposite, as it affords continuity of protection. And I would have to add that it is not really clear at all why the author of the Law Society paper thinks uh, that there would be any people concerned at Section 6 prosecutions uh, continuing. Presiding officer, it would be irresponsible for the Scottish Government not to take steps to, to ameliorate the negative impact that the creation of this gap will have. Surely it is incumbent on all of us to find positive ways to respond to the concerns of organisations representing vulnerable and minority communities such as Stonewall Scotland, the Equality Network, 
Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women's Convention, Scottish Disability Supporters Association and the Equality and Human Rights Commission. In conclusion, presiding officer, I think it is very regrettable indeed that when we see instances of hate crime rising, we would see this parliament deliberately removing from Scots law the specific offence of incitement to religious hatred. Frankly, I find that beyond compre comprehension and I ask members to support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate on Group 1. We move to our first division. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Now, there will be a division, and as is, this is the first division, the will, Parliament will be suspended for five minutes before we vote.
We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 1. This is a 30-second division, and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 1 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 60, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 2 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 60, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to Group 2, uh, which is uh, Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. And I would ask the Minister to move and speak to Amendment 3. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment to delay the repeal of Section 1 has been proposed for purely practical reasons. Ensuring that the bill is brought into line with accepted, tried and tested practices supports the effective introduction of the changes to the law by ensuring that those who need to take account of those changes are able to work to a clear and specific date. This provides certainty and time for all of those affected by the bill to take account of its provisions and to make all reasonable adjustments that are required of them before the date the new legislation comes into force if passed by this Parliament. This amendment therefore promotes clarity. A two-month period from one assent is not odd or unusual. It is simply good practice, particularly as far as criminal law is concerned. The argument that the closed season would offer police and prosecutors a period to carry out preparatory work simply does not hold water. And this is for the simple reason that royal assent usually occurs about five to six weeks after stage three. So the act could be repealed uh, if passed by this parliament as early as mid-April but the current football season does not end until 19th May with the Scottish Cup final. This means that there could potentially be a month of football to be played after the Act has been repealed without Police Scotland or prosecutors having had the necessary time to make the reasonable adjustments needed to ensure the changes in the law are being implemented effectively. Building in a two-month window would therefore allow police, football clubs and supporter liaison officers to clearly communicate to fans that whilst the legislation has been repealed, offensive, threatening and hateful behaviour at football will not be tolerated. Surely, presiding officer, that can be viewed as a good thing. So, Amendment 3 adjusts Section 6 of the repeal bill, which deals with the commencement date of the bill. Currently, the default commencement provision in the bill is for it to come into force on the day after royal assent. Amendment 3 changes this so that the bill would commence at the end of the period of two months beginning with the date of royal assent. In other words, this amendment brings the bill into line with standard practice for legislation dealing with the criminal law of Scotland. I move Amendment 3. Thank you. And I call on Rona Mackay to be followed by Liam Kerr. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak in favour of this amendment. Presiding Officer, the repeal of this Act lacks one thing, and that's a viable alternative. Most recent polls show a 69% conviction rate. 85% of people are offended by chants and sectarian songs. The repeal of this bill sends out an entirely wrong message. Um, as the Minister said, the equality groups such as Stonewall Scotland, e Equality Network, the churches and many others don't even feel safe to go to a football match. And I believe we have to respond to that. 
The legislation isn't perfect. I don't think anyone is saying it is. But I can't understand the rush to abolish this. At the very least, we should wait two months after royal assent to at least consider further legislation and to make the adjustments necessary, um, as the Minister has outlined. I believe there's far too much at stake to repeal this bill now and replace it with nothing. And I call on Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against Amendment 3. This amendment seeks to delay commencement of the repeal by two months. Again, I've listened to the Minister, both today and in Stage 2, and the reasons given for the delay, which I think boil down to suggesting certainty and time to prepare for those affected by the bill, i.e. the repeal, are required. I'm not persuaded. It is instructive, I think, to note that the Lord Advocate has already earlier this month published new guidelines for football to instruct prosecutors to stop using the Act and use pre-existing statutory offences or common law, such as breach of the peace. Even the Lord Advocate is persuaded that this is unnecessary. It is clear that given the media attention... Minister. Um, I, I think if the Lord Advocate were here, you might find that he was a bit surprised uh, to hear the member say that. But I, I think the, the key point is uh, the, the member referred to the guidelines that were issued, uh, I think, towards the end of last week. And of course, as, uh, the Crown Office has to continue its work on a daily basis uh, and it needs to ensure that the guidelines are there. And that, of course, is a matter for the independent Crown Office. But, of course, it is not simply, that is one important strand. There are many other strands, including, as I said, building in time to work for the police, to work with uh, fan liaison, supporters, officers, and all the rest. Does the member not want that time to be there in order to smooth the passage of this bill if passed? Liam Kerr. I absolutely do care. I, I think the important thing... <laughs> the minister appears to have misunderstood my comments. When I say even the Lord Advocate. What I mean is, as the Minister quite rightly pointed out, normal practice might be to wait two months, but even in this case, the Lord Advocate has considered it is better to publish the new guidelines for football already. It is clear, presiding officer, that given the media attention around this matter for some considerable time, it is not as though repeal is going to come as a surprise to anyone. But in any event, I believe that getting the 2012 Act in place prior to the start of the football season was one reason given for its initially being rushed. Following the timetable given by the unamended bill will bring about repeal towards or around the end of the football season, giving the off-season for the new old regime to embed, the police, etc., to carry out preparatory work and deal with any message which may or may not be sent. The time for delay is over. The Scottish Conservatives shall vote no to this amendment and hope that should Parliament's will be to pass the repeal bill, which we hope it is, the repeal takes place with all due haste and no further delays. And as no other mem member has indicated the wish to speak, I call on James Kelly as the member in charge to respond. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to oppose the amendment in the name of the Minister. Uh, the Minister's central point is that uh, prosecutors need time uh, for preparation uh, in relation to the passage of the repeal bill. Um, the reality is um, that, you know, as Liam Kerr said, it's no surprise that we're on the verge of a potential parliamentary vote to repeal the Offensive Behaviour uh, at Football and Threatening Communications Act. Parliament made its view known on this issue as far back as November last year. So prosecutors, you know, should have been well aware that at that point that Parliament had signalled that its intention. Uh, in addition to that, as has been pointed out, the Lord Advocate following the stage one vote has already issued guidance saying that, uh, that, that uh, prosecutors should stop using the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. In addition to that, he, uh, he has also emphasised the use of pre-existing legislation, which backs up the, pack, the fact that there is no gap in the law. So the reality is that this legislation is poor legislation. It's caused a lot of difficulty. As the Law Society has pointed out, there's a lack of legal certainty. It's potentially open to legal challenge. The, the Human Rights Commission also made that same point. So when you've got poor legislation on the statute book, it makes sense 
to get it off there as quickly as possible Absolutely. and use the credible pre-existing legislation Absolutely. to deal with cases that are going through the system. And I call on the Minister to wind up this group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, seeking the two-month period from Royal Assent, as I say, is not odd or unusual. Uh, it is, in fact, ensuring that this bill is brought into line with normal accepted practices, particularly uh, as far as the criminal law of Scotland is concerned. Uh, and it, it does, therefore, promote legal certainty and not the reverse. Uh, and it also uh, is fair to say that whilst, indeed, uh, uh, amended guidelines were issued last week, there are other uh, actors in this process who need the time, as I say, to build, uh, uh, the, 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 to build in a two-month window uh, the, the, the discussions that will need to, be, uh, that will need to take place uh, between the, the police, football clubs, supporter liaison officers, to clearly communicate the new position. I would not therefore have thought it would be unreasonable to uh, allow uh, all those players to have the two months that they uh, would, I'm sure, welcome in order to do that and to do it uh, properly. Uh, I think reference was made uh, by Liam Kerr and perhaps James Kelly about the, uh, the fact that this would take place during the closed season. It probably won't because, as I say, potentially, if the Parliament does vote to repeal uh, tonight, uh, then the uh, repeal could uh, uh, come into effect as soon as mid-April, with one month of football, the football season uh, still to go. So, presiding officer, we are promoting this amendment as a responsible government to promote clarity and to try to uh, uh, respect normal practices that we would expect to see uh, in most other legislation, certainly with regard to legislation affecting uh, our criminal law. As the date when royal assent is given is never certain, surely it is fairer that those who need to prepare for the repeal can work to a known date and have reasonable notice of it. This is not an unreasonable request, and I would have thought that it is in the interest of everyone in this chamber to ensure that our law enforcement agencies can implement changes to the law as effectively as possible. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And that concludes our debate in Group 2. We move to the vote, and the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We'll move to a division, and as this is the first division in a new group, we'll have a one-minute vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 3 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 60, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 4 in the name of Annabel Ewing is yes, 60, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And that ends consideration of amendments.
Now, before we move to the debate on uh, stage three, as members will be aware at this point in proceedings, I'm required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of this bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system or the franchise for the Scottish parliamentary elections. In my view, no provision of this bill does that. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. We'll move in a few moments to stage three. I'll just take a few seconds for members and ministers to change seats. Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 10790 in the name of James Kelly on offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland Bill at stage three. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on James Kelly, the member in charge of the bill, to speak to and move the motion. Mr Kelly, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the motion in my name. The Football Act has been a failure, uh, has not tackled bigotry, it's been widely criticised by lawyers and human rights groups. Football fans have been treated as second class citizens and the Football Act is the worst piece of legislation in the history of the Scottish Parliament and it's time for it to go. The reality is that the legislation brought forward by the government and passed in Parliament in December 2011 against the will of every opposition party has, has not worked. You just need to, even every reasonable member of this uh, chamber contends bigotry and sectarianism, including the incidents that we saw at the, at the weekend. But the reality is that in, in relation to tackling sectarianism, and religious intolerance, this legislation has, has failed. You just need to look at the religious aggravation statistics. 719 charges in relation to religious aggravations in 2016-17. That's actually more in the year that preceded the introduction of the Offensive Behaviour uh, at Football Act. And only 46 of those uh, charges were uh, in or around the football ground. That's not to gloss over religious aggravations when they occur in the football ground. They must be taken seriously, whether at, at football, in the street, outside a religious venue, or in a club. But the reality of those statistics show that the problem of religious tolerance is a much wider one than simply just at the football. And the failure of the government's approach has been They've adopted a simplistic approach in the sense that they thought they could introduce legislation and that would deal with the issue of sectarianism. Sectarianism is a complex problem that has unfortunately been with us uh, for a long time. And it, yes, I will. I, John I, think, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, I think we all agree that this is a wider problem than football, but would he accept that the opinion polls regularly show that the public think football is the main place where sectarianism is seen? James Kelly. What I, what I would point out to Mr Mason is let's examine the evidence and the evidence of the statistics show 719 charges of religious aggravation. That's something that's a, a concern to all of us. It shows that there are issues of religious intolerance 
uh, in society at large. But only 46 of those took place around the football. So there's a gap between perception uh, and reality here. And what we actually need is a much wider and a more serious conversation. And the government have got a job here to try and bring about consensus and bring people together. Rather than uh, cutting anti-sectarianism budgets, they need, to, they need to come up with a different approach. And I'm quite prepared to work along with the government on that. In terms, in terms of the legislation in place, uh, you just need to look at the, the evidence that was submitted in section one to the Justice Committee. Uh, we heard from fans, uh, human rights groups and legal experts. The Law Society told us there was no gap in the law. But it's not just that. Look at some of the human examples. Uh, lawyers told us that the, the kind of common profile of somebody captured under this act was a young person under the age of 20 in employment and not previously, uh, not previously come in contact with the police or the criminal justice system. And that's backed up by the recent statistics that show a th nearly a third uh, of cases you know, didn't result in any prosecution. And if you look at some of the practical examples that have been provided, you know, one was a Rangers supporter uh, arrested at, at Rugby Park on a Thursday night, detained overnight in the police cell, released at half past five in the morning onto the streets of Kilmarnock, had to spend 60 pounds on a taxi to get back to Glasgow to go to his work, incurred hundreds of pounds in legal fees and hundreds of pounds from missing his employment, suffered stress about the impact it was going to have on his employment and ultimately uh, found not guilty. Another example was a Hibs supporter uh, who attended the 2016 Scottish Cup final. At the end of the game, he, he went on to the pitch with his, uh, he was 46, with his growing up uh, son and daughter. Okay, he shouldn't have been on the pitch. But in going on the pitch, he had a wander around, he, he sang a few songs, uh, and then left, and then left to, and then left, and then left. Let me complete the, let me complete the story. He then left to, uh, to join the celebrations with his family. Three months later, at half past seven in the morning, 12 police officers and three police vans turned up at his house. He was arrested and charged under the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. This man was a member of the local community council and the parent board. He resigned because, because he felt worried about it and because of the stress. Subsequently, with the help of defence lawyers, he was able to piece together what he actually did on the pitches. And as I said, he wandered around. He had a bit of a celebration. He didn't commit any public order offences. And, and subsequently, subsequently misusing the charges were dropped. If the treatment, if people were being treated like this, if people were being treated, sure. Uh, just a minute, Minister, yeah, thank just you. to call you. Thank you. I, I'm just not very clear where Mr Kelly is going with this. Is he advocating more pitch invasions? Oh. James Kelly. Oh dear. Well, I'm, well, I'm advocating, Mr Ewing, Ms Ewing, what I'm advocating is the government should stop treating football fans like second-class citizens. <laughs> and summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's quite clear from the evidence to the Justice Committee on Section 1 and Section 6 that this legislation has been widely criticised and discredited. As an approach to sectarianism, it hasn't worked. It's created confusion and division. And it's time, therefore, to consign this discredited legislation to the dustbin of history. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I now call Annabelle Ewing to open for the government. Minister, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The bottom line here is simply this. There is a problem with abusive and offensive behaviour at Scottish football. It is a continuing problem, and it cannot be excused as mere banter or passion. During the Old Firm match last Sunday, some Rangers supporters indulged themselves in singing songs with offensive lyrics added to them, including the songs, 50 Pence Flute, The Billy Boys and Super Rangers. Which MSP in this chamber would describe that songbook 
as mere banter. At the same uh, match, some of the Celtic support joined in by singing songs with offensive lyrics added to them, including Boys of the Old Brigade and Celtic Symphony. Which MSP in this chamber would describe that songbook as simply being passionate? Throughout the match, missiles were thrown between the segregated fans and flares were set off, all with no regard for the fact that children and young people were attending the match, not to mention the vast majority of people who just wanted to enjoy some good football. Who in this chamber thinks that this was all just harmless fun? Before the match, up to 500 supporters, many wearing balaclavas, marched to Ibrox, displaying a banner that said, good night, green and white, with a silhouette image of someone wearing a green and white hoop jersey appearing to be kicked in the head. The group sang both celebratory Rangers songs and offensive songs, including Follow, Follow, containing expletives referring to the Pope and the Billy Boys chant, including offensive add-ons. The flyer that was distributed calling on supporters to participate in these disturbances described the Derby match as, and I quote presiding officer reluctantly, the match against the Fenians. Pictures of the march show some members of the group making Nazi salutes. After the match, uh, no, I won't, thank you. After the match, there were reports of violence between both sets of fans on Govan Road, including a minibus being pelted with glass. But of course, this is not simply a Glasgow problem. On the same weekend, around an hour prior to kick-off in the Edinburgh Derby, approximately 150 Heart supporters congregated in an area near to Easter Road. Offensive singing was heard from them with renditions of their version, the Gorgie Boys, including offensive add-ons. A significant number of pyrotechnic devices were discharged from amongst the Heart support, with three being thrown onto the pitch, resulting in kick-off being delayed. Coins were thrown at Hibs players on the pitch, during the match in the second half was disturbed by pitch incursions. What this tells us, presiding officer, this snapshot of just one weekend of football fixtures, what this tells us, presiding officer, is not that the 2012 Act... Point of order. Point of order, Minister. Point of order, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was just wondering whether this is a ministerial statement which is not intervened on, or is it part of a that, debate? Sit down, Mr Rumbles. <laughs> Uh, sit down, Mr Rambles. It's not a point of order, as you're well aware. It's up to the member, whoever that member is, whether or not they take interventions. Minister. Thank you, presiding officer. What this tells us, this snapshot of one weekend of football fixtures, is not that the 2012 Act should be repealed, but that it should be strengthened and improved to tackle the behaviour that we cannot simply turn a blind eye to. Repealing the 2012 Act without a viable alternative is sending the signal that this Parliament is happy to let such behaviour go unchecked and unchallenged. In the rush to repeal the 2012 Act, there has been a lot of denial about the fact that it will impact negatively on communities across Scotland. Those communities know the negative impact that football can have. Yesterday, Youth Link Scotland and Scott Sound Social Research uh, published uh, independent research which asked respondents about the use of sectarian language and their perceptions of sectarianism on social media. 76% viewed football as the main contributor to sectarianism. This simply verifies the reports of the Independent Advisory Group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland, which noted that football provided a permissive environment which allows sectarianism and other offensive and abusive behaviour to thrive. And there are also the findings of the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey 2014, which found that 88% of people cited football as the most common contributor to sectarianism in Scotland. I would like to make progress. There is a specific pro problem with behaviour at football, and this is widely recognised by Scottish communities. Repealing the Act will do nothing to reassure them. It may only be the minority of fans who behave in these ways, but this still represents an impact that is significant enough to tarnish the reputation of Scottish football and spoil the game for those who simply want to enjoy supporting their team. I'll take Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful that the Minister has eventually decided to take an intervention. <laughs> can, I, can I merely make the case that our shared revulsion at the level of sectarianism and ill behaviour in Scotland, including that associated with football. That is an argument for having good law. It is not a defence for bad law. 
Minister. Can I, to, can I say to the member then work with us to amend it and improve it? Don't take away this uh, protection, this signal that this behaviour is not uh, acceptable in Scottish society without a viable alternative. When we look back further than last weekend, we see that this season alone, presiding officer, uh, in this season alone, there have been reports of racist behaviour from supporters, abusive behaviour towards people because of their disability or mental health conditions. And in October 2017, uh, as I say, a man pleaded guilty uh, for an offence under Section 6 for threatening to shoot and kill uh, Neil Lennon. Legislation does have a role to play, an important role to play in tackling offensive behaviour at football. We do not provide, as I said to Patrick Harvey, protection to vulnerable communities by repealing legislation. We provide it by improving legislation and updating it. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, as a responsible government, faced with what I see as manifest irresponsibility in repealing the Act without a viable alternative, we do remain committed to providing the best legislative framework possible to protect people from malicious harm. And in that regard, of course, I commissioned Lord Brackadell to review hate crime legislation in Scotland. In closing, I say again that there is a problem with the toxic behaviour that we see at and associated with football. The persistent, abusive and offensive behaviour linked to football will not go away on its own. It is an expression of the unhealthy culture that surrounds football and this government will do all that it can to tackle that behaviour, even in the face of the irresponsible moves today in this parliament to repeal the act without any viable alternative yes. being put in its place. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, minister. Yes, I call Liam Kerr. Call Liam Kerr to open for the Conservatives. Mr Kerr, please, five minutes. Uh, beg your pardon, Deputy Presiding Officer, six minutes. I have five on my... Uh, but I'm, I'll be generous with you. I have some I time. To. <laughs> I have I some time in hand. That's, that's my position, refereeing, if you'll forgive, the, the, in this case. I'll be as brief as possible. I open for the Scottish Conservatives and speak in favour of passing this bill. It is clear and unambiguous in its ambit. If passed, it repeals the 2012 Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, and it should be repealed. It is bad law, but more than that, it is unnecessary law. The objectives of the Act were laudable, to tackle sectarianism by preventing offensive and threatening behaviour at football. But as the committee and this parliament heard repeatedly, the offending behaviour which the 2012 was Act was designed to address was and remains fully covered by the substantive existing criminal law. According to the Law Society, all 287 charges brought under Section 1 of the Act in 2015-16 could have been prosecuted under pre-existing legislation. The committee heard from senior police officer ACC Higgins, who said that in the absence of the Act, someone who was arrested for singing an offensive song would almost certainly have been charged with a breach of the peace or a Section 38 offence. Professor Leverick was unequivocal. Breach of the peace, Section 38, and a number of statutory aggravations are in place. Offensive behaviour at football matches could be dealt with under pre-2012 legislation. Now, it may be argued that that is not a consideration, however, if the Act had worked, if it had achieved its objective to tackle sectarianism by preventing offensive and threatening behaviour at football. But has it? Well, first of all, I refer the Chamber to Ms Ewing's comments about just how ineffective this has been and how little it has achieved that we just heard. But Dr Joseph Webster told the Justice Committee that the 2012 Act has made the policing of sectarianism more difficult because fans have got wise how to circumvent the law. Worse, he went on to say that it has led to a deterioration in relationships between the fan bases and between them and the police. And what of the song sheets that George Adam assured us at stage one had all been put away since 2012? Well, Dr John Kelly told the committee that since the 2012 Act came in, there have actually been more of what the Scottish Government might define as problematic songs. Dr Webster elaborated by talking of the reality of what is going on. What fans have done is change their behaviour by holding their hands in front of their mouths while singing certain songs in order to prevent CCTV from capturing them singing them. They have replaced certain songs and chants with other words to skirt the law. So we have an act that has added nothing to the legislative landscape, has not achieved what it intended, and has actually been counterproductive, redirecting, camouflaging, but not stopping offensive behaviours and prejudices. However, I, like many, including some SNP backbenchers, whilst agreeing with the principle of repealing the act, remain concerned at the possibility of a particular message being sent out. I understand that concern and I've reflected on it at length, but I'm persuaded it is not an issue. I just do not accept, and no evidence has been presented, that there is a whole cadre of people sitting at home saying, 
if only the Act was not there, I'd be out singing right now. If those MSPs get rid of the Act, they clearly think these songs are OK. Yes, Rona Mackay. Rona Mackay. Intervention. Uh, does the member um, agree that the equality groups who are actually frightened to go to football matches, do, do you disregard what they said at the Justice Committee evidence session? Liam Kerr. I, I certainly do not disregard the evidence that was given. I think that was extremely important evidence. But I point the member to the point made by Liam MacArthur in stage one, uh, actually, and earlier today. It is deeply deeply irresponsible to be giving these groups some kind of false reassurance that this act is going to protect them. What we have to be doing is taking this away and giving them a proper message that we will protect them. I also think there is also a rather unpleasant assumption inherent in the argument about a message to the football fans. Football fans are being treated as some kind of homogenous, malevolent, ignorant entity. The evidence from SFA, Police Scotland and Fans Group showed unequivocally the number of football fans engaging in criminal behaviour is minimal. And going back to my stats earlier, there were 287 charges, not even convictions under this legislation last year. Just think how many people go to football in Scotland each weekend. To say that ineffective, ill-drafted, counterproductive legislation should not be repealed because hypothetically that might be received by a tiny minority of people in a particular way is not a good enough reason not to repeal it. ACC Higgins said, I cannot arrest my way out of changing hate crime and sectarianism in this country. A far wider approach is needed to challenging behaviour that is inappropriate. And he's right. There is a problem with sectarianism, but it is not exclusive to football, and the Offensive Behaviour Act was disproportionate in targeting fans of the sport. Dr Stuart Waiton was clear to the committee. Has the singing decreased? No, it has been redirected. Is the law working? No, we need to replace it with other methods of behavioural change, with the most sensible probably being early years education. I agree. And furthermore, the police and courts need to use the powers they already have to stop this. Speakers throughout today will no doubt address those solutions, but on the substantive point, is this bill to repeal an ill-drafted, ineffective, counterproductive act in a manner which will not send the message people who are concerned about the right thing to do? Absolutely yes. I look forward to voting for it at decision time tonight. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Daniel Johnson to over Labour. Five minutes, Mr Johnson. Thank I hope you. I've got it right this time. And I understood that, but Thank if you want you very to give me much. an extra minute, that would be fine. Uh, thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the strength of feeling and concern that the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act and in turn its repeal elicits on all sides of this debate. I understand the worry that has been expressed from the SNP benches about, and the concern about the scourge of sectarianism that lie behind it. And while I disagree with them about this bill to repeal the Act, I share their uh, uh, concern about this pernicious aspect of our culture and their conviction that we must act to counter it. But let me say this seriously and gently to them. The 2012 Act does not serve the purpose that is claimed, nor they purport. It provides no additional power to the police or prosecutors. It has had unintended and unjustifiable human consequences. But above all else, this Act has been profoundly illiberal in its effect. Happy to. James Dornan. Uh, clarify for me just what the repeal of the Act will do to help to counter sectarianism? Daniel Johnson. What repeal of the Act will do will enable us to use the existing law, which we'll be able to practice, and, and focus on the causes and of, of uh, sectarianism rather than the context. It is clear from the evidence we have heard through stages one and two of the passage of this bill, and indeed through the amendments we have just debated, that there is no legal need for the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. And indeed, as other speakers have mentioned, the Lord Advocate's instruction to prosecutors to stop bringing forward cases under OBFA and to use alternative statute and common law is an acknowledgement of the legal redundancy of this law and its time on its statutes book is coming to an end. But there is a danger, the repeal of this Act is viewed from a narrow, technical, legal perspective. The real issue with this legislation is not its legal effect, but the very real human impact and the damage it has done. It's when you hear the stories of the people caught up in the unintended consequences and the misguided exercise of this law that the real need for its repeal is clear. The dad, who has been charged three times, only to have his case thrown out of court each time, 
uh, and the, the, with these experiences that not only cost him £4,000 in legal fees, they cost him his job, but perhaps, worst of all, they cost him the opportunity of being present at the birth of his first child because he was in court. Or the man arrested for simply asking why his friend, who was uh, out uh, uh, so, uh, at the football with, was being detained by the police. And apparently, asking this question was deemed threatening and offensive in and of itself. Again, found not guilty at court. Football fans are losing work, losing money, and having their family lives disrupted. This act is putting people with no prior contact of the criminal justice system into a cell and into court, only to be found not guilty. But perhaps most troubling are the stories of the ones which don't just tell, just in a moment, the, of, of the dysfunction in the law. It is the stories that demonstrate the fundamentally illiberal consequences of this legislation. Football fans have been arrested for wearing Che Guevara t-shirts and irony of ironies for flying a banner with the words, act the act on it. Whether you agree with those statements being made or not, people have a right of political expression. In any other context, these acts would be viewed as innocuous or even celebrated as people uh, uh, exercising their civic rights. And on that point, I'm happy to give way to Fulton McGregor. Fulton uh, McGregor. I mean, I think the member will know that, the, that many members on these benches have sympathy with, with some of the things that he's mentioned there. But would you not agree that that's a problem with implementation of the Act rather than the Act itself? And what we should have all been doing is working together to get those aspects right. Daniel Johnson. I would have some sympathy with the member if the police were saying that they wouldn't be able to use the existing law to prosecute many of the actions, but they do. The evidence from the police committee was very clear that they would be able to use uh, other uh, uh, laws such as the Criminal Justice Act uh, in, uh, in 2010 or the Criminal Justice Act 2003 or indeed common law breach of the police. But ultimately what we need to do is tackle the underlying causes. Because the reality of this, when you hear these uh, uh, examples, hear these stories, it is hard not to conclude that this act is a liberal and it is wrong. Defenders of the act and in previous stages of this bill and indeed in the chamber today have fallen back on raising the question of what message does it send if we vote to repeal it. And I acknowledge it is a legitimate function of legislation to communicate what is acceptable and what is not. Likewise, the things we vote for and against in this parliament also send messages. But the question I would pose is this, what message does it send if we let this law stand? A law that provides no additional power to the authorities. A law that has damaged trust in the police. A law that has had huge personal consequences for uh, individuals. And a law that is so profoundly liberal. Scottish Labour is proud to support James Kelly's bill to repeal the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. And we just hope that members from right across this chamber can join us at decision time this evening. Thank you, President. Thank officer. you very much, Mr Johnson. I call John Finney to open for the Greens. Four minutes, Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Can I say, I, I'm really disappointed with a lot of what I've heard so far. Um, the Scottish Green Party has always been opposed to, to this legislation. I haven't personally been opposed. I am now. I think, as I said in the previous debate, I think James Kelly's made his case. He's made his case both on the legal evidence that we've heard, the evidence of fans that we've heard, and particularly persuaded on the human rights aspect. But you know, I would like to make the case that shinties are national sport, but I suppose most folk would say that football is. And to have a government minister trash Scottish football in the way she did, I, I, and that was the purpose of my intervention. The, 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 all the evidence we have, Minister, is that there's the highest percentage of, of residents across Europe attend football matches in Scotland. We heard from the police that they're perfectly capable of policing without this legislation. We also heard from the police that with the exception of two clubs, every senior football club in Scotland has held football matches without a police presence. So the idea, and this is put by, by people in various quarters, that fans across Scotland are at war with the police, nothing could be further from the, the, the truth. Uh, I should have declared at the outset my various associations in, re, mentioned in my register of interest with Hartman Lothian Football Club, and obviously would abhor behaviour like you outlined. But there have been significant changes. I attended my first football match in this city over 50 years ago. My, I policed my first football match in this city over 40 years ago. There's been significant changes. This is a world apart, and that's not just simply down to the removal of alcohol from stadiums or all seated stadiums. There has been a huge move in respect of fan behaviour. Are we, are we, the, the, the situation that, that you outline, no one would support. And I think the language that we all use is very important. So just, just 
Well, if you want to intervene, Minister, I'm very happy to take it. Minister. I'm very grateful for the member taking the intervention. Um, I, I, just to reiterate, I was simply repeating what happened last weekend. It was a snapshot of what happened last weekend. Now, if the member doesn't feel that that is suggestive that for some fans, I agree, it's the minority fans, I've always said that, that there is a problem in and around football, I don't know what would need to happen to convince the member that there still is a problem. John Finney. Well, on the, on the rare occasions when uh, I go to a neutral venues, I often go to see Nairn County. Can I assure you that there's no problem there? There's no problem at the vast majority of grounds. And the behaviour that you outlined is behaviour that would be taking place anyway, in many occasions, and it's behaviour that's taking place notwithstanding this being on the statute book, which I think uh, has, to be, has to be mentioned. Now, um, the, uh, the, the language that is, that's, that's used, uh, I think we all, every one of us, regardless of which side of the debate we're on this, has to respect the parliamentary process. And the legislation that we're seeking to repeal tonight was no more forced through than the repeal legislation, which I hope will pass tonight, is being forced through. There has been scrutiny in both instances, and I say uh, James Kelly very clearly made his debate. We heard very compelling evidence that's been alluded to a number of times. We heard it from Professor Fiona Leverick uh, ab about this alleged gap. We've heard it from um, ACC Higgins, who I, th I think articulated in many instances the dilemma that the police find themselves in. They're going to be roundly criticised regardless, I suspect. But they deal with the legislation that's in front of them. But what we heard very clearly is there's a sufficiency of legislation there already for them to deal with the issues that you've outlined. Um, so going forward, I think the most important thing is we, we do. And if one aspect, if I can just say one aspect about the tone of debate and the language that's been used. I heard Mr. Kelly in response to, to a question say, I'll work with anyone uh, in uh, addressing the issue of sectarianism. And I heard groans around me. Well, let's no one be groaning, but that's, let, let's all get together. Let's recognise this as a problem for all of us. And I'm very happy to work with anyone and everyone to address the scourge that's there. We'll be voting for Mr Kelly's bill tonight. Thank you very much. And, and can I just gently remind members to speak through the chair and not to use the term you in the chamber. For the umpteenth time, please just say the member or name, name the member. That's to all members present. Uh, I now call on Liam MacArthur to over to the Liberal Democrats. Four minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. No one in this chamber condones sectarian or offensive behaviour. Every single one of us, I believe, is genuinely committed to confronting and combating hate crime, whatever form it takes, wherever it takes place. And no MSP or political party can credibly claim a monopoly on caring about these issues. And given the tone and the content of some of what's been said during the scrutiny of this bill, and again this afternoon, I think it's important not to lose sight of these basic truths. It is also imperative, I believe, that we recognise our collective responsibility in reinforcing the unambiguous message that the law will continue to provide protections against offensive behaviour wherever it takes place and continue to provide protections against threatening communications. And of course, the legislative landscape for tackling hate crime can be improved. And I remain confident that Lord Brackadale's review will help us go some way to achieving that. But it is both wrong and increasingly irresponsible for the government to continue fanning anxieties about alleged gaps in the law. This is simply not supported by the evidence. The Law Society of Scotland could not be clearer. The offending behaviour which the 2012 Act was designed to address was and remains fully covered by the substantive and existing criminal law. The bill, if passed, will not leave any gap in the criminal law as existing measures, both statutory and at common law, will allow for the prosecution of any relevant offending behaviour. Similarly, as others have said, ACC Higgins assured the Justice Committee that in the event of repeal, the police would continue to, quote, address the behaviour using other legislation. And already we see the Lord Advocate instructing prosecutors to stop using this discredited, ineffective and illiberal 20 Act and instead to use pre-existing statutory offences or common law. Neither Police Scotland nor the Lord Advocate are talking in terms of gaps in the law or weakened protections. They recognise that this is neither true nor indeed helpful in providing assurances to those who have been voicing concerns and I hope the Minister will now follow suit. After all, while legislation can and does play a role in conveying a message about what we as a society uh, find acceptable or unacceptable, it is surely irresponsible to allow a misconception to go unchallenged that a law is providing protection to people where that is not the case. And I struggle to accept that the wrong message is sent by repealing an act that does not provide the protection its supporters claim. 
But repeal of the 2012 Act is not a do-nothing strategy, as the Minister and some of her backbenchers have argued again today. In the face of sectarianism that we all accept continues to blight too many of our communities. Yes, it will help in removing from the statute book a piece of legislation that not only has proved ineffective, but has actually done more harm than good in terms of our efforts to combat sectarianism and encourage a change of attitudes and behaviours. But repeal must go hand in hand with a renewed commitment to taking steps that we know from evidence are effective. As Danny Boyle from Bemis told the committee, the most sensible thing is to create a universal approach to tackling hate crime that is preventative and rooted in education, but which also has a strong legal remedy when necessary. This is a view supported no, thank you. By the government's own advisory group on tackling sectarianism, which argued that the foundations for change rest in initiatives that focus on prevention and building trust and understanding, recognising that councils, churches, football clubs, schools, the media, community organisations, all of them are key in delivering effective grassroots solutions. Deputy Presiding Officer, I commend and congratulate James Kelly for his hard work and his perseverance on this issue and in bringing forward this bill. And I thank to all those who helped the Justice Committee in our own deliberations. But I look forward to Parliament taking a step shortly that it should never have had to take in removing an ineffective, counterproductive and illiberal piece of legislation from the statute book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr MacArthur. I now move to the open debate. Speeches of a tight four minutes, please. I call James Dornan to be followed by Maurice Corey. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer. If ever the need for the Offensive Behaviour Act was highlighted, it was this weekend. After bringing the Union Bears march to the attention of others on Twitter, I've been threatened, the police have been contacted, I've got meeting arranged with them. I've been told that my 83-year-old mum was dead and I was subject to infantile abuse from grown men, as well as the usual utter bigoted nonsense that you get from the extreme wings of both sides of the Glasgow footballing divide. And there's no doubt in the last few weeks there's been an upsurge in blatant sectarian singing at, sick, at games. And you'll all have seen on Sunday the vile sight of balaclava-wearing, Nazi-saluting thugs parading our streets like some kind of paramilitary outfit. And it seems clear to me that the perceived imminent repeal of the Act has emboldened some of the worst to go more public with their intention to show who is boss. Presiding officer, the Offensive Behaviour Act was brought in because legislation was clearly required to deal with the scourge of sectarianism that blights our game. And despite what our opponents continue to proclaim, this did not happen because of the game of shame. That was just the final straw. In 2009, things were so bad that UNICEF had to ask for reassurance that Rangers would stop singing the famine song. In 2011, the Catholic Church wrote about their concerns about anti-Catholic songs and chants at the League Cup final. And just this morning, Neil Lennon was saying that sectarianism was equal to racism and it should be dealt with accordingly. And I wonder if Mr Kelly thinks that UNICEF, Mr Lennon and the Catholic Church were wrong to raise these concerns and that they should just have let the people sing. And please don't tell me that football can deal with this. As was highlighted once again by yesterday's report that SPFL delegates have constantly had the reports of sectarian singing at grounds ignored. The football authorities are clearly too lily-livered to take on the vested interests of the big two football clubs and have no intention of battling this head on. Therefore, it's been left to the government and I had hoped this parliament to deal with it. And don't insult us by saying there's no support for legislation. The Youth Link report that was mentioned earlier on shows that 80% of people think there's a problem with sectarian language and social media, much of it relating to football. And 72% of them think that posting comments or images on social media which are offensive towards someone because they're a Protestant or a Catholic cause a, 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 some degree of harm to Scotland's image and reputation. And more importantly, 68% of them thought there should be sentencing of some kind for posting sectarian content online. So if these young, the youth link, or if these young people that responded to that think that there's a problem with the Offensive Behaviour Act that this government put in and has been opposed by every other member in this building, it's that they probably think that it's not harsh enough. Now, I urge every politician in the Scottish Parliament to ask themselves if this is the type of country they want to see portrayed to the rest of the world. Because I accept what you've said that there's other ways of dealing with this. Those other ways are, are being attempted as we speak just now. You know, you've all got issues with the Act, but the way to deal with it is not to repeal the Act, 
but to work with the government and make it better. I hear James Kelly and others saying that they'll work with the government. Why haven't you been doing that for the last number of years? You wait till you get your victory, and then you say, now we'll work with you from a position of, of success. I think that this is a, a pyrrhic success, to say the very least. Just think of the message repealing this act sends. Scenes like Sunday will become more regular as these groups of fans become more emboldened. And the truth is, deliberately or not, those that vote for repeal tonight will be enabling this type of behaviour. <laughs> Presiding officer, the only consideration we should have when we vote today is will this decision make Scotland a better place to live in? Given what we've seen in just the past weekend alone, can anyone in this chamber honestly say that by repealing the Act today, we will have done that? Thank you, Mr Dorman. I call Maurice Corrie, please, to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Mr Corrie. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak today as we get set to repeal this piece of unnecessary, illiberal and unworkable legislation. This position was accurately described by Dr Stuart Waiton, a senior lecturer at Abertay University, when he spoke to the Justice Committee recently and said that the Act criminalises words and thoughts. He said that we hide behind the public order issue, but essentially it is about the criminalisation of words and thoughts and the arresting and imprisoning of people because we do not like their words. Dr Joseph Webster of Queen's University, Belfast, and he should know, also told the committee that the Act is not justified on free speech grounds. These are not concerns that are only by academics. The Scottish Human Rights Commission said that the restrictions of freedom of, of, of expression made by the Act are contrary to human rights treaties and in 2014 went as far as reporting their concerns to the UN so that they could monitor whether the restrictions placed on freedom of speech are truly necessary in a democratic society. <laughs> Professor, let me just continue. Uh, Professor Sir Tom Devine labelled uh, labeled the Act counterproductive the Celtic Trust has described how the acts are unjust and says it has a sourced, re soured relationships between the police and fans. Fans groups have highlighted instances of injustice caused by the act, which have only left fa football fans feeling more isolated. Paul Quigley of Fans Against Criminalization in his submission to the committee told of a Rangers fan, of a Rangers fans, uh, fan arrested for holding a banner that simply said, acts the act. And I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason, for giving please sit way. down, Ms McAlpine. John Sorry. Mason. I thank, I thank the member for giving way. Is it his argument that there should be complete freedom of speech for anyone to say anything, or would he restrict freedom of speech in some way? Morris Corrie. Um, I thank the member for that comment. The answer is the existing law covers that, and there, it's there already. This is an unnecessary law to add on top of it, so they can be easily charged for that, and you know that as well as I do. And he also spoke of a Motherwell fan who was arrested, held in a Greenock prison for four days, and then convicted of singing a song that simply included profanity about a rival team. Now, I don't appreciate swearing nor profanity at any sporting event, but I certainly do not believe that it is worthy of a criminal conviction. Andrew Jenkins of Supporters Direct Scotland, who submitted that the act is counterproductive, said you cannot have legislation that applies to one specific sector of society. That is grossly unfair. These comments come because of the Scottish government's, uh, sorry, for the SNP government's failure to reach out to the football community. Paul Goodwin of the Scottish Football Supporters Association spoke to the Justice Committee of the Public Relations Failures that accommodated this act and how it had left fans feeling targeted. Not just football fan groups have pointed out the unfairness of this act in only targeting football fans and matches alone. Stuart Reagan, of the, for, the former chief executive of the Scottish Football Association, said that the football had been targeted and singled out and as a piece of legislation has been put in place that focuses exclusively on football. No other sport has had that and no other element of society has had that. Between 2004 and 2013, at the various t at the Tea in the Park events, there were 3,600 incidences, three attempted murders, three drug-related deaths, 10 sexual assaults, one abduction, and 2,000 drug offences. A summon was not called by this government at tea after Tea in the Park events and had no never, uh, emergency legislation put in place. So it is clear that both, football, both the football world at large want to see the Act repealed and that the general public do as well. 
A lot of people and organizations took part in the members' bill consult consultation, and a hefty 71% of the respondents backed the repeal of sections 1 to 5 and 62% supported the repeal of sections 6 to 9. And you must wind up, please. Right. <coughs> the, 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 the fact the Act has failed to tackle hate crime, the, the Black and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure in Scotland Group have said we are not convinced that it right. appropriately or effectively tackles hate crime. And the Assistant Chief Counsel Higgins talked to the committee about how we cannot arrest our way no, out of no, hate No, I'm so crime. sorry. You must conclude it. That means right. now. Please sit down. Yeah. I now call Joanne Lamont uh, to be followed by George Adam. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say that when thinking about what I was going to say in this debate, I made a number of efforts to write a speech, but thought that it was difficult to judge how this debate was going to be conducted, whether it was going to be like stage one, whether things would have moved on. And I have to say to the Minister, I regret in the strongest terms the tone that she chose to use in introducing the Scottish Government's position. I don't, think, I don't think she served her own party well to impugn the motives of everybody in this chamber who disagrees with her and captures in a description of what happened at the weekend the suggestion that people in here celebrated that, thought it was a good idea or in any way approved of it. The, the fact of the matter is that there's no monopoly, as has already been said, of concern about sectarianism in this chamber. I recall from the very beginning when this legislation first came into being, the troubled way, the way in which we on our benches tested it, worried about it. I did it as justice spokesperson and as leader. I did not take the decision lightly to support James, James Kelly's legislation. And it is offensive, if I might use that term, to suggest otherwise. It is not whether we support sectarianism or not. The issue is how best to tackle it. And at the heart of this bill that act, there is a problem that it conflates being offensive with being sectarian. And as a consequence, people are caught up in legislation with no means of avoiding it. And we've heard all sorts of examples of that. And I find it deeply offensive that there is a suggestion that everybody else in this chamber is somehow irresponsible and have not thought these through issues um, in great detail. And I know that there were people, including the churches, who wanted us to tackle the question of sectarianism. But I doubt very much if those same churches, those same organisations, thought that young people should be caught up in the legal system for wearing a Che Guevara T-shirt or having the audacity to express a political view. Don't call them in defence of your position. They were arguing about the question of sectarianism, not about the merits of this legislation. And again today we hear the argument about the fact that it sends out a message. We have already said, and we've heard in here, that this characterisation of football and football fans is simply wrong. It does not happen routinely, even in the old firm matches and games that people support. It doesn't routinely happen at Pollock football ground. It doesn't happen in grounds across the country. And we need to name the problem in order to deal with it. It also, we're told, sends out a message about our views on sectarianism. I'm not sure how much of a comfort that would be to me if my son or my daughter got caught up in the legal system for doing something they were not even aware was an offence. None of us would want that for a member of our family, and yet that is the reality for all too many people who have been caught up by this legislation. And also, what message does it, in all seriousness, send out about our commitment to tackling sectarianism when the budgets for programmes that educate our young people, that talk about these issues, have been cut from £3 million to half a million pounds. The reality of this, there is hard, heavy lifting to be done on this. Not simply pass the legislation and hope for the best. You actually need to do the heavy job of winning hearts and minds on these issues. There is no easy fix. But of course, the other argument that is deployed is, as I've said, to impugn the motives of the political parties who oppose the SNP's legislation in this regard. Now, that argument might work in here. It might work as some comfort to SNP backbenchers who have been whipped in to supporting it that the only reason we are doing this is because we oppose them politically. But we are talking not about what works in here, but the reality out there 
in the real world. Can you, this, please, can you please conclude? Sure. I urge people to support the James Kelly's bill because out there in the real world, it is not working. It's having dire consequences. And experts and individuals from across Scotland have told us that. We have a duty to listen to Thank you very much. I call, uh, call George Adam, the last speaker in the open debate. Then we move to closing speeches. Members have been warned. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Everyone knows that I'm a football fan and it's an important part of my life. And it's, this is the way I will approach this debate and have done during this whole process. Our national game is an important part of our country's life and can, on some occasions, affect the national mood as well. And this act is actually about offensive behaviour at football, something that football fans have experienced at various points, at various matches in their life. And football is so much to me that, along with Gordon Scott and my colleagues on the board of St Murn Independent Supporters Association, we led a fan buyout of St Murn Football Club. I was involved in this from the start because I believe that fans play an important role in football and at every club. But like most teams, we have a fierce and competitive rivalry with another team. In our case, it's Greenock Morton. Do people sometimes go over the score at our derby matches? Probably. But on the whole, they are good-tempered affairs with enjoyable banter between the fans. Currently, St Murn are top of the Championship and Morton are fourth. fourth. Both teams could be promoted to the Premier League this year, and I hope we both are. A nerdy Renfrewshire derby in Scotland's Premier Division for the first time since the 1980s will do me and probably Mr Macmillan now quite nicely. Because the thing is, I don't have a hatred of Greenock Morton. You know, and this is where I have difficulty with the whole Rangers Celtic thing. I don't get it. The hatred and bile towards one another, to me, seems alien. In the political world, I have disagreements with many in here, but I do not hate them. I do not sing songs of hate towards them. I just have my debate, say my piece, and we move on. But the majority of football fans do behave themselves. It's a small, very vocal minority that tend to bring our beautiful game into disrepute. I was reminded of this on Monday when I attended my local gym, and I know, presiding officer, you're wondering what, maybe I should get my money back from that gym. But while I was there in the cafe having my post-training roll in bacon, I listened to a couple of Rangers and Celtic fans having a, a, a discussing the football match. And it was good, clean fun filled with humour. And it was a nice reminder to me that in this week of all weeks, not all old firm fans are like what we're led to believe. Not one sectarian comment, not one mention of the various cultural aspects of both teams. But then we look at what happened on Sunday. The Union Bears marched under their banners of hate. A young Rangers fan whose hearing was damaged, a footballer abused at an airport departure lounge, and the old song boots from both sides coming back to the fore. We had all the usual chaos that ensured an old firm game in Glasgow in the West after that game. We know that these things continue to happen, and one of the reasons why I support the Act is the fact that it protects the majority of fans from this behaviour. Now, I'm, going to go, I'm not going to go over all the original reasons and all the debates we've had in the past, but let me say some of the things that were said by some of the people that came in front of us. Stonewall Scotland expressed concerns about repealing the Act. We would have concerns that an outright repeal of the Act would send a worrying message that prejudice-based and threatening behaviour at football is acceptable. Is that truly, presiding officer, what we want to put out to the world, that people are actually thinking that this could be acceptable at football? Scottish Council of Jewish Communities said, we urge the extension rather than the repeal of this legislation. Presiding officer, this week BBC Scotland reported that former SPFL match reporters stated that the reports on sectarianism and unacceptable behaviour have been ignored by football authorities. If this act goes, not only does it leave a gap in the law, as was said by the Crown Office and Procure Fiscal Service, it puts an onus back on the football authorities to actually do something about this issue. And I, for one, presiding officer, do not hold out any hope on that one. This debate, I believe, should be about us looking at doing post-legislative scrutiny. Let's actually not say that this place is not good at doing post-legislative scrutiny. Let's look at this act. Let's decide that we're going to make changes and make it better. I urge everyone, presiding officer here, to not repeal, but to look at this act and make the act better. Thank you. I now move uh, to closing speeches. I call on Neil Finlay to close for Labour. Four minutes, please, Mr Finlay. President officer, I think, like everyone here, I loathe sectarianism, I loathe bigotry, and I detest prejudice. prejudice. And uh, like most members of this parliament, I'm committed to working towards a tolerant, cohesive society where people learn about each other, understand each other, and live in peace with one another. 
Uh, as Joanne Lamont uh, said in her speech, we must put time, effort and money into addressing these issues that seek these issues that seek to divide our society and promote hatred and undermine social solidarity. I oppose the offensive behaviour of Foot Football Act from the start because it is a misguided and simplistic attempt to address a complex uh, societal problem. I strongly believe we should repeal uh, the Act by passing this bill today. I support the repeal of the Act because, as Liam MacArthur said, it is illiberal. For this Parliament to restrict and take a backward step in relation to human rights is wrong. And this bill singles out one group of sports fans who have their rights removed from, uh, from them for stepping across the threshold of a football stadium on match day. I support repeal because it's based on class prejudice. The Act has, in the main, though not exclusively, uh, uh, criminalised young working class men whose actions uh, are uh, seen as distasteful by those who believe that they had a go have a God-given right to be the arbiters of good taste and impose their beliefs, their taste and belief systems and values on others. Certainly. James Dornan. And I think it was probably on this subject. Talked about the fact that football was pricing itself out of the reach of the ordinary working class guy. Now what you're saying to us is that this bill is targeted at the exact same people you're saying has been priced out of the game. How does that work? Exactly, Mr. Dornan. Exactly. Mr. Mr. Finney, there. I'm just calling you to speak. Exactly, Mr. Dornan. I think football is pricing itself uh, away from its roots. But people are so committed to their teams that they will spend that money, whatever, to go to matches and give sacrifices to the rest of their lives. And that's the reality of it, Mr. Dornan. So I, I support the repeal. Uh, as many members have said, because uh, it, is, it is unworkable, uh, as expressed, uh, the views expressed by the police, lawyers, prosecutors and judges. I support repeal of it because rather than uniting fans, communities and the police uh, acting as one against sectarianism, it has increased tensions, resentment and division, division between the police and fans. We should seek to address sectarianism across society as a whole. We all want young people and indeed older people Growing up learning to be tolerant, empathetic and respectful uh, to all. And in my experience, the overwhelming majority are. We're more likely to tackle sectarianism through education, through youth work and in our schools, colleges, universities, pubs, uh, bookies, shops and workplaces. And by continuing to fund anti-sectarianism projects, youth projects and PSE in schools. All areas, all areas where funding has been slashed. This would be a better investment than demonising young football supporters. President officer, I, uh, I am pleased that members rejected all of the amendments for the reasons set out by James Kelly, and I hope that the issues around Section 6 will be addressed in the review of hate crime. Finally, can I commend my colleague James Kelly for his diligent uh, and, co and committed work in taking this bill through to this stage of the parliamentary process. Taking a bill on your own uh, and to, to this stage is a huge commitment, not just of the member, but of their staff team too. They have done this with skill, reason and principle and have united all of the opposition parties. And I hope even at this late stage that government backbenchers who know in their hearts and minds that the Football Act should be repealed will tonight do the right thing and support this bill. Uh, the Act was ill-conceived, badly drafted and difficult to implement. This is the right move for this Parliament to make today. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. I call on Margaret Mitchell to close the Conservatives. Five minutes, Ms Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's clear from the contributions today that although this is a contentious bill, all the opposition parties are united in their support for repeal of the 2012 <coughs> Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act. When the original bill was debated at Stage 3 in 2012, Concerns were raised that it was badly drafted, it failed to define the behaviour it was trying to criminalise and it did not include a de definition of sectarianism. In addition to this, there were warnings that the original act restricted freedom of speech and discriminated against football fans. These warnings have now come to fruition. The Justice Committee has heard during the passage of this bill 
that bad drafting has resulted in the Act being applied inconsistently by police officers. And as Liam Kerr pointed out, conviction rates under the Act are at three-year low. The 2012 Act created two new offences. Section 1 offence covers offensive behaviour at regulated football matches, and Section 6 covers threatening communications and applies more generally rather than being directed solely at football fans. Through the scrutiny of the 2012 Act, it was argued that stakeholders, um, by stakeholders that existing measures were already in place with these two, um, to deal with these two offences. This view was again expressed in the evidence heard by the Justice Committee at stage one of the repeal bill before us today, when stakeholders argued that Section 1 offence can be prosecuted under other offences, including breach of the peace and Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act 2010. The Section 6 offence provision refers to threatening communication with the intention of stirring up hatred on religious grounds. And the heated arguments that the scrapping of Section 6 will leave a gap in the law has not been helpful today. And I would ask the Minister to reflect on this. The fact is, the offending behaviour which the 2012 Act was designed to address was and remains fully covered by the substantive and existing criminal law. And Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act would cover Section 6 provisions. Moreover, as Jane Kelly pointed out, in the case of Love Against Procurator Fiscal Stirling 2014, religious aggravation was added to, section, to, to a Section 38 offence. In terms of the government's amendments to preserve Section 6, six for 12, uh, Section 6 for 12 months, the Law Society makes the very pertinent point that the timescale of 12 months could also be seen merely to complicate what might otherwise comprise a straightforward repeal of the 2012 Act, which will and has uh, attracted much publicity. It will be confusing to the public to believe that the 2012 Act has been repealed, but then to find that prosecutions under the Section 6 Act could continue for a further period. The intent behind James Kelly's bill was that once royal assent was achieved, the bill would be repealed immediately. Again, according to the Law Society, continuing any of the provisions is not required as the transitional arrangements will take account and provide safeguards for any existing prosecutions. Moving forward, everyone has agreed that sectarian behaviour and intending to stir up religious hatred um, is totally unacceptable. If this is to be stamped out, wherever it exists, then it will require all stakeholders, and as John, John Finney said, parliamentarians too, to work together. As, the Scottish, uh, as a start, the Scottish Football Supporters Association has made some helpful general points about the need for a national campaign to educate on abusive language and behaviour. And there will, going forward, be an opportunity to discuss all these issues and the best way to resolve them in a measured fashion in the context of Lord Brackendale's future review. And I hope, presiding officer, that's how the, the chairman determines, uh, the chamber determines this evening that we will move forward. In the meantime, the Scottish Conservatives will vote for the 2012 Act's repeal this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. Call on Annabel Ewing uh, to close the government. Five minutes, Minister. Uh, presiding officer, today we have heard a lot about the problems people associate with the Act, but no tangible solutions to the problem of abusive and offensive behaviour at Scottish football that I described in my opening statement. All offensive behaviour at football has to be met head on to be defeated. Why do we continue to excuse aggression at football, which manifests itself as racist, religious and homophobic slurs and bigotry as simply banter or passion? That is not acceptable. Legislation sets the standard for what is and is not acceptable in modern society. Therefore, legislation has an important role to play in tackling all uh, societal problems, including offensive behaviour at football. We recognise that legislation on its own will never resolve any social issues, and the Act has always been just one element 
of our work to tackle these problems. When the Act was introduced, Offensive Behaviour Act in relation to football was at a high, with bewildered public witnessing pitch-side violence between club managers and bullets and explosive devices being sent to prominent Catholics through the post. I am baffled as to why so many people in this chamber think the pre-existing legislation is preferable to amending the 2012 Act. Repeal is going to solve nothing. Repealing the Act will have consequences. It will leave a gap in legislation and I point to the Crown Office evidence, evidence that no opposition member has even seen fit to mention in the debate because it doesn't suit their narrative. It will put constraints on the ability of prosecutors and our courts to tackle offensive behaviour at football. It will lead to a lack of continuity of protection to vulnerable and minority communities. Presiding officer, I can see no positive in repealing the Act without putting a viable alternative in place. If the argument is that the Act should be repealed because it is not working, then how can the answer be to go backwards? It is naive to believe that returning to the pre-Act days will do anything other than return us to the circumstances that led to the need for the Act in the first place. We have invested £13 million since 2012 in tackling sectarianism more than any other administration, with £9.8 million having been directly invested to support community-based organisations to deliver grassroots work. This unprecedented investment to date has allowed the delivery of nearly 200 projects across Scotland, including work with schools, football organisations, churches, youth groups, adult education organisations, employers, prisons and local authorities. This work has made and is continuing to make a huge difference in communities across Scotland. Despite attempts to reduce this agenda to legislation and football, it has never been simply about these issues. If the Act is repealed, we will continue, of course, to support work to tackle sectarianism, to fulfil the recommendations of the Independent Advisory Group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland. In the next financial year, I will ensure that the current half a million uh, pounds worth of funding is protected by a real terms increase to support this agenda. Presiding officer, as a responsible government, we are committed to taking whatever action is needed to offer protection, I'm not sure why people are laughing, but to offer protection to our most vulnerable communities, including restating, reinstating an improved version of the provisions in section six. I've also given a clear commitment to considering all of the recommendations to be made by Lord Brackadale, the outcome of his review of hate crime uh, legislation in Scotland expected shortly. Presiding officer, I ask all members in this chamber to think very carefully about what they are doing today, to consider whether they want to repeal a piece of legislation that was introduced to tackle a problem that we all know exists, whether they want to take away protection that minority communities and organisations such as Stonewall Scotland, the Equality Network, Victim Support Scotland and the Scottish Women Convention have told us that they value and whether they want to send the signal that offensive and abusive behaviour is acceptable at football. The repercussions of repeal will be felt by the very people we wish to protect. We have heard arguments that the Act is an infringement on the human rights of a minority of football fans. But when do we ask, ask ourselves who has the greater priority, a person's freedom to sing an offensive song or chant, or the victim's right not to be humiliated, vilified and marginalised by offensive songs and chants. The vast majority of fans don't sing offensive or sectarian songs, don't march to matches wearing balaclavas and carrying banners glorifying violence, and don't need to worry about the police intervening in their behaviour because they have no reason to. The majority of football fans are tired of those who continue to behave in this hateful and prejudicial way. The Scottish Government stands on the side of the tens of thousands of football supporters, the length and breadth of Scotland, who are fed up, are fed up with offensive and threatening behaviour being part of the Scottish game. And presiding officer, we shall shortly find out whether the opposition members of this parliament stand with them or stand against them. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. I now call James Kelly as the member in charge to wind up till five o'clock, Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I think Liam MacArthur was right when he said uh, it was important to get the tone in this debate right and there's a responsibility on all of us uh, as MSPs as we debate these challenging issues. And I have to say I really regret the fact that some of the speeches from the SNP benches tried to associate the events from the weekend uh, 
with the actions to repeal this legislation. I thought that was, I thought that was, that was really poor. It goes, goes without saying that every MSP in this parliament, across all the parties, rejects and condemns Absolutely. hateful and bigoted Absolutely. behaviour wherever it takes place in a football stadium, in a street or in a club. There's been a lot of discussion about you know, what, what message this sends out, retaining the existing legislation or repealing that legislation. I think the, the problem with the existing legislation is it sends a very weak message. The reality of the situation is that only one political party has supported the legislation when it was introduced in 2011 and all the way through uh, to this debate on the repeal bill. What message does that send when only the governing party has signed up, has signed up to such uh, discredited legislation? Even as a piece of law, it's been criticised by the Scottish Human Rights Commission. It said it could be open to challenge uh, under ECHR. The Law Society thought that the vague, uh, the vague definitions in the Act and the wide reach of the Act also meant it could be challenged uh, under courts in this country. So what that results then is, is, is weak legislation. And with weak legislation, you have a weak message. So I completely reject the idea that keeping the legislation in place in some way sends out a powerful message. It's completely not the case. Now, there's been a lot of discussion also about how we move forward, what the alternative is. And I think that is um, very important. Um, I think the first thing we need is a proper discussion to understand all the issues. As I said in my opening speech, the fact that we've got 719 religious aggravation charges, the highest for four years, shows there's a major issue here. And what we need away from this debate is a proper uh, growing up discussion. Added to that, yes, I'll give it to Patrick. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to James Kelly for giving way. When this act was first being debated, I made the case that what was needed then was a comprehensive hate crime review. Now that that's taking place, does James Kelly agree that once the polarised debate on the question of repeal is over, uh, and we will be supporting that, as he knows tonight, we all have a responsibility across political parties to embrace whatever positive changes come through from a well-considered and well-thought-out hate crime review that's currently taking place and take actions as a result of its recommendations? James Kelly. I think, I think Patrick Harvey makes a very powerful point, and I can remember him making those... Uh, arguments in 2011. The Brackadale Review gives an opportunity to make hate crime legislation more, I'm sorry, I'm short of time, uh, could make hate crime uh, legislation more effective and efficient, uh, allied to robust pre-existing laws, and that will send out a powerful message. I think the other thing that's needed, uh, as the Justice Committee uh, highlighted in their evidence, is proper investment in education and communities to tackle sectarianism. And it was, uh, it was regrettable that, you know, Annabel Ewing uh, said that, you know, nobody offered any solutions. She clearly wasn't listening to the speech Neil Finlay gave when he argued not only for these type of projects, but also for proper funding rather than cutting the funding as the SNP, the SNP government have done. You know, they, they, they preach about sectarianism and we all support that, but they, they do that on one hand and then cut the and then cut and then cut the budgets then cut the budgets on the other. I think that no, I won't take the intervention. I think one of the most powerful speeches in the debate was that of John Finney, and he speaks as a former police officer, as a football supporter, as somebody who supported the original legislation. Uh, in 2011 and I, he was right to express concerns about the Minister's contribution at the start of the debate uh, which really kind of again underlined the point that I made that there's an attitude in some in the SNP that, they, that football fans uh, are second class citizens but John Finney, John, Finney, John Finney made a lot of very powerful points about how we move this debate forward if repeal is successful tonight. And summing up, uh, presiding officer, 
Joanne Lamont talked about the real world. And the reality is that in the real world, this act uh, has been a failure. It's completely failed to tackle the issues of bigotry and religious intolerance. It's been unfair to target football fans, a legislative disaster and completely illiberal. Not only that, but on the SNP's watch, we've seen worthwhile co community projects tackling anti-sectarianism being cut. So therefore, presiding officer, at tonight's vote, MSPs should show the Football Act the red card. Thank you. That concludes our stage three debate on the offensive behaviour at Football Repeal Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11069 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for Tuesday. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11069. Formally moved. Thank you. No one's asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 11069 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And before we come to the decision time, um, members will be aware uh, stage two of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill has now been completed. And stage three amendments should be lodged by 12 noon on Monday, the 19th of March. 12 noon on Monday for the a deadline for the stage three amendments. So there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 10790 in the name of James Kelly on the offensive behaviour of football and threatening communications repeal Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10790 in the name of James Kelly, yes, 62, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> that concludes decision time. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>